Welcome to the MIT Center for Art, Science, and Technology's 2021 Symposium, Unfolding Intelligence, the Art and Science of Contemporary Computation. CAST was established in 2012 with the goal of building and building on connections between the worlds of art, science, and technology. This is the third in a series of symposia that CAST has convened since then, and as with its predecessors, we bring together artists, scientists, engineers, and humanists from within MIT and from the world at large to discuss areas of rapidly evolving research and urgent social relevance, and to find in that dialogue stimulation, confirmation, provocation, intersection, and we hope common purpose. At MIT, CAST partners with departments, labs, and centers to integrate the arts across the curriculum to enrich and encourage artistic collaboration and to provide support to faculty and members of the MIT community as they pursue their own artistic practice and or research. In addition to symposia like this, CAS facilitates the sharing of this creative work beyond the Institute by producing concerts, exhibitions, and publications, and making them available to the public. So thank you for being with us today. We hope you will join us throughout the week at virtual events addressing the aesthetic, technical, and critical issues pertaining to artificial intelligence and computational media. We also look forward to seeing you on Friday, April 9th, as the symposium culminates with a live interactive event to which all attendees are invited and which you can join presenters and artists in breakout rooms to explore hidden threads between all that has been discussed this week. Welcome to the Q&A panel for Deep Time and Intelligence. My name is Will, and I'll be moderating the discussion today. We have with us uh, four brilliant speakers who I, I'm, I, I hope all of you have had a chance to uh, listen to over the weekend. Uh, their talks from Marcus Bueller, Holly Herndon, Gary Tomlinson, and Antonio Tralba were um, a, a true pleasure. And before we get into my opening remarks, synthesizing some of those uh, fabulous contributions and kicking us off on this hour long discussion, I just have a few thank yous. Really bringing together this kind of group to create uh, an encounter between arts, sciences and humanities requires uh, uh, an enormous amount of work. So first to uh, my, my fellow conveners, Caroline Jones, Stefan Helmreich, and Fox Harrell, thank you. And I hope all of you in the audience have the opportunity to listen in on their conversations and, as well and, and uh, join us in, in discussions with uh, all the speakers that they have brought to bear on this um, discussion of info unfolding intelligence. And also to the cast producers, to uh, Dana and Heidi and Catherine and Leah and Lydia and Harry and all the work they've done supporting us in the background, organizing the communications and, and logistics for today's events and contributing to the beautiful website that they've created that I hope you all have time to dig deeper on uh, in engaging with us in, in, in these discussions. And also to Jen and Lucy um, for providing ASL interpretation today. Um, very much appreciated. So without further ado, I'll, I'll um, move to my opening remarks and we can uh, see the, the, the rest of the panelists with us here today. Deep time and intelligence. 
if there were a single thread that I felt knit together these three fascinating talks on sound, time, and the formation of intelligence across scales and modes of existence, I would have to hone in on the concept of variety. The question of variation is a fascinating one, clearly central to Gary's attempt to define radical niche construction by sensitizing us to the pervasive plasticity of niche construction. In that context of inquiry, I was able to sense the core of the key semiotic information concept when Gary spoke of a bird listening and singing as a varied complexity of the world proportionate to the varied complexity of the brain architectures thereby enlivened. To react, to reach after clarity with respects to a genuinely semiotic variety here would have to enliven a sense in us not only of the emergence, selection, and optimization of a function, say, for addition or vocalization, or for auditory feature detection, but a sense of the plasticity of niche constructions that take place through a mind that can relive the relation of interior variety to exterior variety. The sound of bird song in this light, sounds by which a bird does not merely fulfill a reproductive function, but rather relives a relation to not only another bird, but to the variety of song, senses and throws a voice from that vocal commons in a new direction, recasts the tone of another, let's say, play with, in and through the plasticity of the niche. Learning to sense that plasticity, to respect it, a feat of reflection, surely, and one I believe the question of AI training practices can help us think about. I would be curious to hear Gary's thoughts uh, uh, and thoughts on his talk that would help us listen for the hints of when it is that AI forces us into thinking clearly about the genuinely meaningful. Does AI open up such a space of reflection on variation or does it lock us into a thought of the functional? Perhaps before we ask, is AI as smart as a bee? I want to hear in Gary's final provocation, a questioning that enlists us asking, have we, in ent entertaining Gary's reanimation of the mental world of birds and bees, found our thoughts wandering to a thought or relation to AI that sees the maintenance of a differentiation of the functional from the meaningful at work? Curious then to listen to Holly and Marcus, fascinating that both of you also named Bach when discussing this concern over variation. One of the central concerns in training AI systems to sing and play is that they not reproduce in AI systems aesthetic cul-de-sacs, as Holly put it. But how practically to avoid that? I know that Marcus is very interested in using MIDI data to train his AI, and that Holly and Mo Marcus both have different approaches to using either MIDI or audio data in their training sets. So I was also just wondering simply if Antonio had thoughts on generating and designing audio training sets and what stakes that technical decision has in preserving or shaping data into something that generates desirable results. What is a desirable result then? A surprise, an optimal performance, a novel or meaningful variation? Taking this thread of data set generation back to radical plasticity with Holly's differentiation of sampling from spawning, I heard an important distinction being drawn, one that would force us to rethink the plasticity of the niche in the economic context of the digital music marketplace. I was inspired by Holly's phrase when she pointed out that we must remain attuned to the entitlement to a shared musical past when building data sets. Would it be generative to invoke the concept of niche and then infuse the plasticity of same with stakes, cultural, political, and ethical aesthetic? Does AI help us think about the mutable plasticity of the sonic commons, in other words? Scene ownership and niche production seem to complement and trouble each other here. And I would love to hear further thoughts in the vein of this role of AI in shaping a reflection on or even staging a vari variation in scene construction or constriction. The idea of variation for Marcus seemed to hinge on the idea that AI can add new information. In his case, working with molecular dynamics simulation, that information would be generated by computers trained on the archaic memory of primordial forces at work in protein folding. 
those forces adding to and reconfiguring data presented to our machines from the musical archive. Here then, data set creation comes into dialogue with data generation and also points to the mathematical and scientific constraints placed on information generation. Professor Taralba too, in his comments on the manual manipulation of GAN generated images, touches on the concept of variation when he suggests that neural nets have imaginations. In the history of philosophy and poetry, the variation of images in the imagination was famously called upon by Locke and Hobbes and Hume, Blake and Coleridge, and made to point of a contention. Are those variations always concatenations of sensory impressions, primary and secondary qualities or properties of matter reconfigured by the brain? Or are there forms derived from the mind or spirit that intervene and shape that raw material of variation? With the manual addition of grass neurons to dome drawing neurons, those questions somehow become more concrete, less binary in the hylomorphism of mind and matter. While we could localize the function grass, even in a single artificial neuron, those localized manipulations produce results that seem to imply a network of other related functions, like on top, yellowish, fuzzy, gleaming. In seeing these in instances of localization in neurons returning weird results, condensing so many categories into a pixel distribution, I was wondering if Marcus or Gary saw something to trouble or confirm their thoughts on properties versus processes, patterns of energy localization versus plasticity set in motion. Are neural nets unhinging us from the object, from stable substrates configured into materials with properties? And certainly I can return to some of those questions um, and call on uh, individuals, but I will um, perhaps leave the floor open uh, to see what reactions this might have produced. Holly, I hear you. I, I see you smiling. Would you would you would you, would you care to interject? Um, sure. Thanks so much for that overview, and thanks to all the panelists for your really interesting and inspiring presentations. I really enjoyed getting to learn about all of your work. Um, maybe I could just touch on um, some of the things that you brought up. Um, it, I did. I did kind of chuckle to myself a little bit when I was watching Marcus's um, presentation, and he brought up Bach. Because in my presentation, of course, I'm using it as a criticism, um, as you mentioned, this kind of aesthetic cul-de-sac, you know, this idea that a lot of machine learning research is um, looking to kind of recreate forms of the past. But what I found interesting about Marcus's work is that he's actually bringing in other forms through the, um, the protein uh, structures in order to kind of open up and um, and add new information to the Bach training set. So I think he avoids the aesthetic cul-de-sac in a really interesting way. <laughs> yeah, there was a, maybe I can add to this a little bit. I mean, Will, thanks for the great introduction. And I, I took some notes and um, there's a lot of really, really cool intersections that you identified. But yeah, I, I wanted to say that the what what we do in the work, we we're trying to put um, different levels of information um, from different species or different scales um, on a on a platform where they can communicate, um, and we call it sometimes interspecies communications when we talk about spiders speaking with humans, or in this case, um, of Bach, um, looking at data that's been generated hundreds of years ago, speaking with data that's been generated over billions of years during evolution, and we found that that transition into an abstraction. Um, whether it be it mathematically rigorous, like in category theory, or um, using sound or coding into these um, audible barcodes, the way to do that. And what's interesting is that then you have um, the ability to use AI or computers as a way of creating this communication in a way that wouldn't be possible otherwise, because either the the, the actors are have long been um, are long dead, or um, they cannot talk to each other. Like we cannot speak to spiders immediately. So I found sound to be a very effective way for this abstraction, and. Um, and adding new information is something I would say we've done for many hundreds or thousands of years, actually. But computers allow us to do this in a perhaps more systematic way or reaching observational levels that our brain isn't wired for. So I found really interesting when um, Antonio was talking about you know, finding the neurons and particular layers um, that that we grasp in an image or great dome structures. And I and I think that's a really interesting mechanistic insight we can gain from these neural nets that is really hard to pinpoint in our own brain, right? We can't identify 
these kinds of things in our own brain very easily. Yes, so actually I can comment a little bit on that. So I think that um, it's uh, it's very interesting to see what these uh, AI systems are learning when you present them with training data. And it is true that there is uh, a piece of it that is about recreating the past, as Holly was mentioning. Uh, but but in this uh, representation that the systems are are discovering, which are not for humans, you know, humans are only uh, presenting the data to the the systems. But the representation seems to be somewhat meaningful, and this is what allows us then to manipulate the representation and to put grass in domes and so on. And one thing that we discover is that it's not just that there are units that represent particular concepts that emerge just from the training uh, procedure itself, but also these relationships, as uh, you know, as uh, as it was mentioned in the introduction, the fact that grass only goes on top of certain surfaces. That was something that at the beginning it just seemed to us as being quite accidental, but uh, then we discovered that there were uh, that actually the network was learning all those relationships. For instance, there are some units that will learn to draw doors, but and now you can manipulate them and say where you want to have a door, but you cannot put a door anywhere. Like if you have an image and you try to put a door on the sky, the network will just not do it. Even though you are activating the units that draw doors, they will th those activations will not survive the rest of the process, and they will get cancelled out. And the network learns all these kinds of relationships. And one interesting thing is that now you can imagine a process where you change the way that the network uh, uh, generates data so that it violates some of these principles and it starts generating data that looks somewhat real but it doesn't is something that does not necessarily exist you can start putting things where it's not possible you can change the loss of light transmission for instance you can uh, one thing that we notice is that whenever there is a window the system learns that there should be some reflections appearing on top of uh, shiny surfaces well you can change those rules and start having reflections where there are no windows or reflections disappear when there are windows. And, and there are very simple changes that you need to make. So one could imagine that eventually you could generate data that feels plausible, but is not real. And breaking that pull the sack that, that Holly was mentioning at some point. May I, uh, <clears throat> may I leap in as well here? The, the, the presentations were all fascinating. Will, thank you so much for the, for the wonderful introduction. Um, the, the, the question of, of grass on the top of the church <laughs> is what I want to return to. And, and uh, you know, I thought, uh, Antonio, I thought your, the, the, the machine learning that was going on there was absolutely fascinating. I really want to, to, to press you to, to understand exactly what it means to think that there is a single neuron, so to speak, that is the grass neuron, for example, that has learned that somehow. Because, of course, attuned neurons are in biological systems are absolutely fundamental. The, the, the honeybee sucrose neuron, for example, that I mentioned in, in, in my presentation is an example of that. And the sensitivity of it is, is constantly in plastic change in relation to, in relation to its environment. Um, uh, but one of the things that's striking about those images that were generated by machine generated images after this learning process um, came up in the question of the watermark that you mentioned. It is to me exactly the mark of the difference between uh, a machine algorithm that has learned certain things but doesn't know how to contextualize its learning in an environment and a, a, a biological mind. The difference is precisely in the fact that no biological, uh, no human taking all of those pictures and, and instructed to draw another picture would include the watermarks. And yet the machine cannot but include the watermarks unless instructed to do differently. Um, where would you? Yeah, it, that, that's an interesting question. The machine realizes, well, realizes, it tries to reproduce the same data that you give it to it. And watermarks are part of it. Watermarks were not present in all of the images but there is a percentage of them that contain watermarks. So what happened is that the network will produce sometimes images with watermarks. And, and in fact, we located where those watermarks are generated. And it's not just one single unit. Generally what you have is a small population of units, maybe 20 units out of 500 
that represent a particular object. And in particular, watermarks, there are some units that were doing those watermarks. So now you can, for instance, say, you know, I want these units to never be active. And from that, from that moment, all of the images that this process will generate will not contain watermarks. Or you could reverse it and always have them active, and then all of the images will have a watermark. So the, the system doesn't have the, 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 the knowledge of what this means. So for a human, you know, you could know that the watermark is really not important and then decide not to put it ever. But the machine, the watermark or the do or a door, they are all equally important. So I can if, actually if, imagine, if, oh, sorry. Please. I was just thinking specifically about the watermark. It reminds me of kind of like net expressions where artists began to incorporate some of these kind of aesthetics into their into their own aesthetics. So I could actually imagine um, a kind of, um, you know, human creative mind also integrating the watermark. But then that would, of course, be through a kind of human um, understanding of comedy or, you know, the context would be entirely different. Yeah. And, you know, in, in a certain sense, the context, the, the word imagination came up at the end of, of uh, in regard to the grass on, on the top of the church. Um, uh, you know, the, the human imagination, talking about deep time and intelligence, the human imagination, there's a wonderful phrase that archaeologist, that an archaeologist introduced 30 years ago, uh, and that has been tracked in archaeological proxies across 500,000 years of hominin evolution, long before Homo sapiens came along. And the phrase is the release from proximity. That is, the gra what gradually unfolded in hominin intelligence was the, cap was the capacity to imagine things that weren't there, that weren't in front of the senses. In some cases, imagine things that were minimal counterintuitions as opposed to what was actually seen in the environment. In, in more dramatic cases, finally, to imagine things that never have existed. Um, uh, and, and of course, humans are fantastically good at this. Um, uh, this release from proximity is a long-term evolutionary thing that, that, that hominins have come to be able to do. Neanderthals were probably pretty good at it too, um, uh, but certainly Homo sapiens, all Homo sapiens are great at it. Um, that seems to me different from simply manifesting something that never existed through the machine learning that you're talking about. And I think those, you know, those differences, this is not to underplay the extraordinary achievement of these neural nets that you put together. This is amazing, it seems to me. It's amazing work. And yet the gap remains somehow between what they're up to and what a human imagination, any human imagination can be up to. Maybe I can uh, uh, share a few thoughts on, on this following. This is a brilliant, brilliant point. Um, um, thank you, um, uh, Gary, and, and also related to the other ones. What we've been doing, um, 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 with using data from original compositions like Bach was to actually seek information that might have been encoded in this data. So we used MIDI data. That's another discussion on whether MIDI data versus audio data or fluctuations of that. But, but let's say we take that data and we've been seeking um, patterns within that data that holds hidden messages that the creator of this data, Bach in this case, or other people that might have created music at the time, have encoded things in that data that they weren't aware of. Right. So I'd like to hear actually Gary's thoughts on this, um, on what the, the context might be from your perspective on this. This was another level of human imagination, not just things that aren't there, but imagining things unconsciously that were there in the past, but have, that have been forgotten. Right. So these structures about protein folding or internal structures in the organs were known at the time when Bach created the music, yet we've shown that there are structures in the music he created that resemble biological um, systems that have been evolving over billions of years in the evolution of proteins, for instance. You know, I, I mean, I, I don't have, of course I don't, Marcus, I, I don't have any full answer to, to such a broad and wonderful question um, and, the, and the kinds of questions that are raised by, by what, you've been, what you've been working on. Um, and yet, um, uh, the, what you what you have what you are demonstrating it seems to me is the continuity uh, uh, across across cosmic dimensions. Of course, I have a phone call coming in right now. I just turned off my phone. Sorry about that. Um, the the continuity across across even cosmic dimensions and at all scales, spatial and temporal scales um, of of vibrational essences. Right. Uh, the, the those vibrational essences are in themselves manifesting at least a, a rudimentary structure. Right. The, the the notion of vibration is a structure. It seems to me a process 
at the same time and, and a dynamic structure, but a structure. And so, so to, to begin to under, unfold the, the, the continuity across all those degrees of, of, of scale, the continuity between um, uh, that kind of uh, structure and the structures that human minds come up with. Um, you know, uh, uh, Will uh, mentioned in his introduction birdsong, and of course I mentioned, in, I talk about birdsong. I am constantly um, uh, wanting to say that, of course we call it birdsong, of course we humans do all kinds of things with this, but to call it song at all is probably a misnomer as long as we are doing, as long as we are imposing human, uh, some general sense of, of the human value in song on, onto those sonic structures. But they are immensely complex sonic structures, immensely communicative sonic structures in complex social systems. And all of it then comes back to, to the sense, you know, this, well, the vibrational sense that you are working with. So, so my question for you, Marcus, would be once you have translated, for example, the, the aria to the Goldberg variations, once you've translated it through the filter of amino acid vibrational dynamics, um, well, two things. Um, it doesn't come back as the aria that Bach composed, even though we could hear traces of that aria set, we could hear echoes here and there. Um, it comes back as something very, very different. Um, but why doesn't it come back as something even further, even more different, even more radically different? Haven't you converted uh, some of these amino acid dynamics into a set of pitches that is, after all, a very, very small subset of all the frequencies that we hear. Right, yeah, correct. I think maybe well, so in, that in, in responding to that, um, I'm, I'm curious to, to um, reconfigure the question slightly, to maybe bring us back to um, a, a question that's coming through um, in, in, in the back channel chats right now, is that when we're having these discussions about um, whether it is merely a function or some kind of meaning, or whether it is a, a, a genuine variation or something that repeats a difference that's already encoded in the data set. I'm curious is if af, as practicing scientists and artists, if you find yourself developing an intuitive sense of how to negotiate those questions in the choices that you're making as practitioners. So when you're searching for a genuine variation, what kinds of techniques or choices are you making? When are you confronted with those almost ontological conundrums um, through the work that you're generating? And I think that that, that has to do with um, the, the aesthetic choices that maybe Marcus would be uh, con confronted with in seeing this new variation of the aria and having to decide you know, whether to perhaps change the, 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 the force equation that he's, he's using to model the protein fold or, or for, for Holly in, in, in building these file systems of all these different variations that you showed us on these audio files, uh, negotiating somehow with like what the basic building blocks of a composition are as they're, they're, they're derived from this engagement with machine learning systems. So yeah, I'm really curious in, in Gary's question too, but I think that that, that, that dimension of, um, of, of practice is something that the audience is curious and of, of hearing more about. That was that was that was directed. I I, I had understood particularly at Marcus. <laughs> I don't want to put or, him on the or, spot. Or, or Holly, certainly. Like, or, or, or Professor Teralba is also engaged in the practice of building data sets as well. So I'm I'm, I'm curious if those if the if that if that uh, if that you know. Um, well, so I can maybe I can briefly answer and then let everyone else also say something. But there, there are a lot of choices, of course, we make. Um, and I would say um, a little bit to the question of Gary and the generalization that Will talked about. The um, we choose, of course, the universe or the, the platform we're building. Let's say the sounds from, and uh, in this case, we're working with the amino acids. And actually, in the in the case of the, the deep area that we created, um, we're actually working not in the innate amino acid scale, but in a in a in a in in, in an equal temperament scaling to reflect back what Bach actually originally intended the music to sound like. So we make a lot of choices in this, and um, it's a discussion that's much longer in, in what are the more abstract ways to, 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 to look at that. And I think your birdsong example actually reminded me of that. When we do listen to proteins or, or structures like this in the innate um, vibrational spectrum, um, we have a hard time understanding them and accessing them in our brain because we're not attuned to these, these ways of thinking or listening. 
Um, so we are trying to make choices that make it accessible to certain regions. Um, I would say that we want to make uh, interpolations um, similar to a, an expansion in the series, a Taylor expansion, where we, we want to look at a reference point, in this case, the ARIA, um, and the original way it's played in equal temperament, and then extrapolate from there um, a little bit out what would this additional information from protein folding add to this, this structure. So, um, so we can make those choices and we can go um, either very far away or we can stay reasonably close in this piece that I presented in the, in the, exam, in the, in the presentation. Um, there was a compromise between going too far, um, but also being able, like you say, to recognize fragments of it. And that's what I, I wanted to show is there are these fragments, you can recognize them, but there are also differences and distinctions which are very clear and they tell the story of what this deep time memory really brings to us. So it's not the computer alone doing it. I think Will had that 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 point when we discussed, and I and I and I also mentioned this in the in my talk. Um, you know, in in the rendering of the actual final product, there are many choices we make as humans, um, and that's oftentimes misunderstood, right? You have these. Um, algorithms that um, you know, create songs and, and and I think Holly mentioned some of those some of those things in her talk as well. Um, there are a lot of choices, of course, that we need to make, um, um, and we're very far away from, and maybe perhaps in, in, infinitely far away from letting it completely be automated by a by an algorithm. For me, as a composer practitioner, my, my ultimate goal is I'm I'm trying to create meaning through the artwork that I'm making. So it's a kind of a meaning making a search, um, and so as um, as Marcus mentioned, you can't really outsource that to a machine. Um, really, I see machine learning techniques as a way to augment my process, particularly um, ideally a performance, uh, an embodied performance practice. Um, that's where I really think um, things will get interesting and start to uh, to take off when we're able to, as humans, music with other humans and machines in kind of concert together. That's when I think new um, new aesthetic possibilities and new ideas will emerge. And so that's what I'm primarily focusing on right now. I haven't been focusing so much on kind of, um, you know, the statistical analysis of certain existing forms and trying to kind of create new forms from that. Um, so that's another reason why I really... Um, tried to focus on using audio material rather than MIDI data because there's so you know as as a sound artist and composer I find so much um so many kind of sensual qualities in sound um as material um and for me um a, a kind of MIDI representation of uh, of a piece is is missing out on so many of the things that I that I find sensual about music. Um, so trying to kind of understand what might be sensual about one sound source and then trying to understand how I might then um, augment my performance practice to be able to perform through that sound. Um, that's been kind of my approach um, to, to remain in the kind of driver's seat of, uh, of, of composer and meaning maker. Yeah, I think that is also something interesting about with respect to the choices that we make, there are choices at so many levels. You know, the, the data that we use to train our system, the representation that we use, whether it's MIDI or, or the raw audio, um, and also the architecture that we use to process that data. And the choices that we don't make, we still make them. We are just not aware of them. So that's, that's where all the biases come in that you know, creep into our systems that we might not be aware of them, but the system is just trying to reproduce what it sees and it's limited by the architecture and the representational power that it has given the choices that you made on how you implement that a particular approach. So all of these things have an impact on, on, on the results that you have and the behavior that you have on, when you use a particular system. A phrase of yours, uh, Antonio, that came up in your earlier comments, not all of the variations survive the rest of the process was very fascinating to me that you could manually manipulate with something in the system that you're using to generate a variation, but that the system seems to have implicit constraints built into it. That is, is something that I also you know, reminded me of, 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 of Marcus's approach in, in, in the sense that there are limitations or, or constraints on the, 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 the kinds of data that he can generate. And that's 
has an interesting creative effect on the work, that working within limitations is one of the interesting aspects of the new kinds of creative processes that are that are at work here. It's almost that we know about rule constrained art making practices from conceptual art, for example, but we're operating with uh, with a different set of limitations here, ones that we may not even be able to explicitly identify if, if, if all of the rules governing the net are not completely trans transparent to us. So I'm, I'm curious if, if these thoughts on the kind of uh, the kinds of limitation setting um, role of AI uh, have 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 been um, uh, whether those have been of interest to you as uh, as researchers and and whether you wonder about what constrains the validity of results in, in these sorts of systems, whether it be scientifically or aesthetically. Yeah, I think that um, uh, the way that I see current AI systems, uh, especially the, the ones using neural networks, I think it's been true maybe for a long time, but especially true nowadays, is that we have these systems that are composed of very simple operations and they have to through these simple operations and recombining them, you know, they have to produce some complicated task. You know, they have to solve some complicated task. And it, each, it, each iteration of the process, I see it as a, as a filter in a stage where you remove undesired sources of variation and a recombination stage where you try to find new concepts from the data or, or build a more sophisticated representation. But that recombination process is very simple. So the way that you build a complex representation is by removing undesired sources of variation and recombining the concepts a little bit, and then removing again undesired sources of variation in this new space and recombining again and so on. And that's how the process evolves. And this is why you, meet, you need like a lot of different stages of processing. And in the case of the brain, or you have all the neural, all the, all the different layers of, of neurons that process the data just moving one step towards you know, whatever task you wanna solve at the end, whatever representation you wanna build. And I think that uh, is, is, we are very interested in trying to see how much of that representation and the, the way that the representation will get transformed is understandable by us. And I think that some part of it will be understandable and there are some other pieces that will not, um, that maybe are not because they are not really based on rules necessarily, but they are a little bit more intuitive, you know, let's say. But I think that um, there is a big piece of it that will be understandable. Uh, that's my personal belief. And I think that uh, from the artistic point of view, I think that is very interesting. Then once you have these representations and if you understand some of the rules, how do you break them? And, and what, what, are, what are the things that you get out? And I think that things like abstract art and so on are maybe, you know, representations that preserve rules to some level of that processing, but they don't go any further. You don't try to recombine those things to get at the end, like real objects. You are just st st stopping very early on and try to see, okay, how does the representation look like at this level? Um, I, I, I want to leave in here and, 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 uh, and push a little bit further on that word representation. It's a word that is used by cognitivists all the time. It's one of those words that I have trouble with because it's rarely defined as clearly as it might be. A mental representation, this is a phrase that recurs over the last 40 years everywhere. And um, we still have very little, well, we have ideas about what a mental representation might be. And indeed it comes down to something that looks, it seems to come down to something that looks, Antonio, a little bit like what it is coming down to precisely in, in the in the algorithmic neural nets that you're that you're that are learning in your in your work. Um, uh, but boy, I, here's where my imagination fails me. To get from there to what it is that that allows me to put together a whole elaborate context that tells me in 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 trying to draw a picture that answers to 50 pictures that you've shown me that I don't need to include the watermark, for example. That it seems to me is 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 a uh, is is a huge leap beyond what machine learning is is doing to this point. And you know, uh, Will focused in his remarks on my presentation focused on, uh, on the question of plasticity and the relationship between organism and environment. Um, you know, genes are not what we once thought them to be. It turns out, genes are not blueprints. They 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 are in fact uh, they are in fact 
uh, interacting at all moments with the environment on all scales, um, down to the momentary scale, in fact, in terms of which genes can be expressed at a moment, uh, at a moment's notice in, in order to direct behavior. So they have a directive executive function, and yet that function is nothing like a stable blueprint, nothing like it at all. So in that sense, intelligence itself can't be localized in either a machine or in my brain. Intelligence is localized only in the process that extends from my brain out to the whole environment or from the machine out to the whole environment. And so the gist of my talk finally was to ask whether, whether machine learning is coming anywhere close to that kind of, of, of hugely varied on all scales um, interrelation and hugely complex interrelation between environment and, and, uh, and, um, and machine. Um, Let me say one thing, but I think that uh, one missing piece uh, is uh, the embodiment. And so current AI systems are not embodied or you're poorly embodied. And, and I think that is um, you know, the case of the watermark. Why, 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 are, why are watermarks important? It is, it is really because many other things that are outside of the picture. There, is, there are other social implications that go outside of what the picture contains and 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 ai systems generally they focus on on few sensory modalities you not know, like we've been talking about audio you have images there is also the tactile world world when it's when you put all these things together that you start grounding things and you still have these limitations you still even when you have multi multiple sensory modalities you will still have some other choices to make. But I think that it provides an additional grounding that AI systems now don't really have. Uh, it's not that you know, the research community is not aware of that. They, they are aware of it. It's just that it takes time to get there. And it's, I think uh, many of the advances that we are seeing now, they have taken us by surprise in the last decade. And it takes a little bit more time than that to, to start building other things. And, and there are still many, many other breakthroughs that are necessary. Uh, really, all of this is just um, now just learning relationships between things and, and going through a machine that is able to have like critical thinking and things like that is something much more complicated. Can I, uh, can I, can I piggyback off of that wonderful response and, 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 and ask Holly a question? Um, Holly, one of, the, one of the last things you left us with was the, uh, was the effort to, um, uh, to have Spawn work in your performances in real time, in your live performances in real time. Um, this seems to me somehow related to the, to the, to the difficulties and, and the challenges that, that Antonio was just talking about. But I wonder if you could talk, talk to us a little bit more about how, how you begin to close that gap. Well, it became, you know, really clear early on that I wanted to remain in the driver's seat as a composer, so not to try to outsource that job. And I think that speaks directly to some of your earlier questions about the kind of um, the kind of state that AI finds itself in at the moment. I I don't see it as um, outperforming me in that role of um, contextualizing the the world around me and creating uh, original works that speak to my context specifically. Um, so I did decide to kind of try to focus on live performance, but of course this is a huge challenge because with sound and um, processing, you have a kind of latency. And so if you're trying to perform, if you're singing, I mean, right now I even, there's a latency between my um, my camera and speaking to you and, it, and it's already slightly um, uh, disorienting, but if, if this, uh, if it was happening in audio on a stage, it would be almost kind of like an insurmountable challenge. Um, so the real problem is basically um, computation <laughs> time and um, yeah, just the, the, the amount of time before um, the signal can be processed before it comes out the other end. So that's what we're basically working on right now, trying to kind of pre-train pre models that we can then perform through that I find really interesting. But another way that we tried to um, incorporate some of these ideas into our live performance before we had the technology really ready is we we were looking at um we were looking at 
basically how as soon as anything can become captured in media, like an audio file, video file, text file, whatever, it can become part of a training canon. So almost as a kind of like public announcement, we started incorporating uh, training ceremonies into our live concerts. So one of my vocalists would sing a line and the audience would sing back and we would record this and we have recordings from concerts all over the world with different audiences and we can then create um, audience models that sound unique to each room um, that was performing because you know different different countries different cities have different vocal traditions different size crowds etc um, and so you know as a performer trying to find ways to um, communicate some of the more complicated ideas to a wider public through the through incorporating the public into a training ceremony, but also trying to aestheticize the event and show that it does actually require a kind of um, you know, human labor and human expression in order to in order to create these these training sets themselves as a way to try to communicate that, you know, what comes out the other end isn't just some kind of like, you know, random alien um, produced um, thing. It's something that comes from human culture and human creation. Um, so yeah, that's why I've, I've focused quite a bit on where my training sets have come from, um, a lot about how we deal with our shared human archive. Um, it's one of the things I really enjoyed about Marcus's talk is that he's really thinking about things on a, on a really long time horizon. I've really been thinking about it on a kind of time horizon of, um, recorded media. So, you know, we have this shared human archive of video and film and photograph, and you know, we can we can reanimate the dead that we have an archive of to to kind of do whatever we want them to do in the future. And so, I think it opens up all kinds of interesting questions about what we do with that that shared human archive. So, hold it one question then. When, when you um, use these recordings, um, I mean, coming back to this question of representations, the, um, the way you, you want to be the, on the driver's seat of, of the AI system. So that means the AI system is building some, some is decomposing the sound in some ways, building some representation that you can manipulate and, and generate new sounds with. And my question, you know, when, when I was watching your talk was, what 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 type of um, what type of representations or what type of decompositions are you looking for what, um, so that you can actually um, control them in the way that you want? Well, so I've largely been focusing on performance techniques. So um, when I say I want to remain in the driver's seat, I'm largely writing the phrases uh, or the compositions, and then I'm performing them with my human voice, but I'm able to perform as a flute or as whatever kind of, you know, instrument that, that I've modeled. Um, so that's, that's one way or another way is sometimes I'll write something and then kind of, um, create variations, um, on that, um, motif and then interject and, and pick the parts that, that are useful and interesting and kind of move on from there. I think, a lot of people who are coming to music and machine learning that have maybe less experience with it, they imagine this kind of fully automated um, black box where you just kind of like type in an idea and out comes this fully fleshed um, piece of music. And maybe we're, we will get there. Um, but, you know, two things. One thing is the, the, um, the information that that went to um, to training um, in order to get the piece in and of itself um, that came from somewhere that came from a that came from a, a humans musicking in space coming up with uh, aesthetic ideas together. So that's one thing that I don't think should be forgotten or erased. Um, and the other thing is that it's just simply not that sophisticated, or at least what I've been working with is just simply not that sophisticated yet. You know, it it has the kind of um, equivalent of the watermark all over the place. And it takes my composer's ear to go in and you know, remove the watermark or, or, or leave the watermark, but with intention um, and, to, and to make whatever I'm creating have relevance to the world around me. Because music isn't just... A combination of of note relationships. It's it's not like we can just do statistical analysis on scores and then fully understand the the human emotional aesthetic. Um, it's constantly shifting, and 
you know, whether or not a 808 drum kit or a 707 drum kit, that brings with it an entire history of um, electronic dance music to it that um, that the my computer at this time doesn't doesn't understand at all doesn't understand that kind of history or that kind of weight. So um, yeah, I think while it is so so interesting and so powerful in so many ways, it is also so limited and requires so much of my own intervention in order to make something interesting. And that's why I think it's exciting, actually. Um, can I add a, um, uh, another part? I mean, this is really, really great, Holly. Um, one other thing that we have found, if we're maybe forgetting the AI component, but just to look to uh, natural systems like a protein or molecules or a spider web, there are really interesting uh, musical structures in these. And so in some of the work we have, um, not, not with the use of AI, but basically just mirroring these structures um, into um, audible sound or, or musical space, with human choices, of course, I mean, they have to be made, um, but there are a lot of really interesting things, um, not using AI, but just looking to nature. And um, you can look at the, you know, example of work on spider webs, where you look at the uh, really intricate sounds you can get as you wander around and the, the proteins, the folding, creating uh, quite complex counterpoint structures that are, um, however, not necessarily the kinds of things that we expect. So it really comes down to the frame. As you were talking, I kept thinking, you know, there's this, the, the moment of expectation, um, um, or the, the history, uh, you mentioned the, you know, great examples of the choices of the instrumentation, uh, and the same goes for the music generated by natural systems. Um, and I think connects also with what Gary was talking about the bird song, you know, these are not things that we expect. And I think one future evolution, I think, as we are become part of the performance and the observation, um, as you were doing, Holly, in your performances, um, we actually become part of the experiment as listeners. And I think the plasticity that the species have, I think we have to maybe develop that as, as listeners to music as well. And that opens up a whole new dimension in understanding. And I think it's in, in the world of um, people thinking about composition and how music is evolving, that's more prevalent, of course. But if you um, look at a broader public and audience, um, there's uh, much room to grow, I think. And I think that's a great opportunity for, for all of us to, to work on and communicate. And that, that's why I was talking earlier about the reference frame. If we begin with this weird reference frame that nobody understands, we cannot bring the, the audience to that point. So I oftentimes like to move the audience from something they understand. And so the, the ARIA was an example for that and moving away from that, interpreting away from that, um, and then showing this other space that opens up. But I, but I feel, yeah, also as a teacher, you have to bring the audience from, when I teach a class at MIT, I have to bring the students from where they are to where I want them to be or what I want them to see. And I think similarly in music as well. Antonio, I'm, I'm curious, when you, hear, when you hear Holly speaking about these um ritualized entrainments this 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 reminds me of that that um uh ingenious and and, and hilarious passage from your your presentation with the, the the greatest hits data set where there was almost some kind of theatrical presentation of the of the of the process of producing data and this is another uh, another theme that i also hear hear marcus talking about regularly about how much of the creativity going on in 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 AI and the arts has to do with the generation of, of, of data sets. So when you when you hear uh, these these thoughts about the, the 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 plasticity of a public's perception of a musical tradition being the medium that's being worked upon through the practice of of, of training in AI, does this does this um, uh, incite your 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 imagination as as a practitioner within the uh, the, uh, the 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 bowels of the, the Gary Building over at Seasail? So I, I think that um, the creation of the training data sometimes is a little bit uh, considered like um, a secondary job. You know, uh, there is a, at least in in, in technical settings, you know, it's uh, always a lot more interesting to develop the algorithms. And the training sets themselves are not so interesting. I actually think that, well, not just me, I mean, many people do, but um, training sets are actually just as important as the algorithm. They are the question that you want to answer. And the creativity that goes into producing the data set sometimes is just way more important than the algorithm itself. Like, for instance, uh, what Holly was mentioning about recording uh, different audiences around the world. That type of data 
is really interesting and it will create, you know, I'm sure it will create lots of opportunities of producing some really creative results. The algorithm itself is going to be secondary. I mean, it certainly will change the outcome, but it's going to be kind of secondary. The, the, the main thing is the data that was used to train. And, and I think that the, uh, thinking about the training sets, the questions that you want to ask and how that training points towards an answer. How do you avoid uh, maybe putting too much of your biases towards what you think the answer should be into how you collect the data? I think that those things are, are really important. And I think that, uh, you know, as you were mentioning, train, train, the training data set is a really, is probably one of the most important parts of the creative process. Uh, can, I, can I add really something to that really quick? So this is one of the reasons why we, we like to use AI um, for data from proteins or DNA, or maybe sounds from spiders is because if we filter them you, through our own brain and then extract information, let's say for musical inspiration, we're biased by the kind of history we have in our brain. Um, AI is kind of, for me, and I think, I think it was Holly who mentioned this in your, in your talk, um, that you start from a blank slate, essentially. The AI has never heard anything. They've never heard any music at all. So the first music that, um, in my case, I don't have a name for it. You have a great name for it. Um, but our system, um, our computer system, um, listens to these hundreds and thousands of proteins and, um, and is, has a very abstract knowledge of these, but never heard any other music. And so in that sense, it's a great way for us to start from a clean slate and then incorporate the human intervention after that fact. So we found it to be extremely useful and important to avoid the bias from the human perception. Gary, were you going to jump in there? I, I, I had I had a thought about your 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 work actually there, and I think we might actually be edging towards an answer to your provocation. Because if we were to think of the AI system itself as being responsible for answering the question of the generation of meaning, we might be missing out some of these other observations about how that algorithm as an analog for the gene is always within a context. And that context has to be something that is transforming and rendering plastic the movement of the genetic code through time. So you have to set in motion, as you were saying, Gary, you have to set the algorithm in motion through these acts of contextualization, through these acts of carefully managing the creation and preservation of an archive for the AI to genuinely gain this radical plasticity of knees construction. And this, this is something that I find so, so fascinating hearing about um, Marcus and, and Holly discussing these various musical archives because it does really bring to the foreground how this in, in, entitlement to shared cultural history is very much at stake in these discussions. And that, that creating some kind of ground around which to recognize that the, 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 the preservation of these materials and, and, and this data and the organization and structuring of it is really what will set the, the algorithm in motion and transform it into a process to, to, to elevate it above the, the emergence of, 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 of the function or of optimization. So this, this, these might still be early beginnings, but I think we're, we're, we're hearing in, in this discussion that the importance of composition and, and, of, and, and of contextualization can never be uh, um, extricated from the design of the algorithm in that the algorithm is, is nothing without the data set that, 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 that feeds it, in other words. You know, in, in, that, in that sense, you know, when I talk about, uh, when I think about an embodied AI, um, uh, I think these examples that we've been hearing today are all instances of embodiment in AI. It is not, it is not so much about a body as it is, as it, as it is about a, a set of contexts within which algorithms are unfolding. And the data sets have everything to do with those contexts are crucial as Antonio was just making clear. And as both, uh, both Marcus and Holly's presentations made very, very clear, um, uh, all of these are, are reflecting human choices. I'm not one to think that we are anywhere close to a Kurzweil singularity in, ter in, terms of <laughs> in terms of AI taking over the world and so on. Um, but what, what it brings home to me again and again is the, is, is the miraculous nature of even the simplest life forms that we, that we can think of, the, the, the miraculous nature of the complexity of their moment-to-moment -moment, um, embodiment and contextualization. 
Um, and this is, you know, this is, this is, seems to me, the, the challenge of, of AI for me as, a, as an outsider to all of this, fascinated by it, but very much an outsider, the challenge is not to create the machine that thinks like a human mind. The challenge is to create systems that are interacting with their environments in, in some degree of, com that, that approximates some degree of complexity for even the simplest biological, or uh, simplest life forms interacting with their environments. Or so it seems to me, but this is just the question that occupies me, I guess, when it comes to AI. And I think it's a question worth contemplating for many years to come, certainly. And with that, we, we, we have reached the, the end of our hour long time slot. So I just wanted to thank all of you for these brilliant comments. And I think we've made a lot of connections here that were, that were nascent in your talks. And I also want to point out that we've hit upon a number of, of, of topics that will be coming up explicitly as the focus of discussion in the other panels. The question of bias in AI, and in AI will be addressed later on in, 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 in the, the program, as will genetic algorithms and data set creation and open systems, and even later today, unfolding models. So I, I invite you all to, to, to join me in the continuation of these discussions as we reinforce enforce the connections to these other important topics in the discussion. And with that, um, I, I, I suppose we will sign off and I would, would like to, to thank you all again so much for your, for your contributions today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>